Hello everybody! Welcome back to my channel. I'm Mustard Saves, and today we're going to be making all of the bread products. I truly hate baking sometimes, but I love eating baked goods, so <laughs> to save myself some money and some sanity, I've decided to make a bunch of them in one go, and I want to show you guys what I made today. The first thing I got started with was a loaf of bread in my snazzy new bread maker. It's not new at all, it's just new to me. I found it at a local thrift store for a whopping $5, and it's been a great appliance to have on hand. As you can see, I'm just using your average all-purpose flour rather than bread flour, and really the only reason for that is I haven't entirely convinced myself that bread flour is a necessary expense. My grocery stores never have the generic brand of bread flour in stock, and as you can see, I'm only willing to pick up the fancy stuff if I can find it on sale or at a discount. And so far, we don't hate the texture that the bread comes out as. I'm sure there's a difference between all-purpose flour and bread flour, like it's a whole like gluten difference, protein difference, or something like that, so it will make a different kind of bread, but it's not totally necessary if you're willing to just have, you know, a different type of bread with just all-purpose flour. For the yeast, you'll often see recipes reference bread machine yeast, but that name kind of fell out of fashion in the 90s, so what you'll more commonly find it as is instant yeast, but you'll also find active dry yeast in the grocery store as well. And I believe there's also a measurement difference, so if you're using like a teaspoon of active dry yeast, I think it's less instant yeast. There are like measurement conversions that you can find online, but for this one I'm just going to be using the active I'll try to leave a link in the description to all of the recipes that I'm going to be using today. I don't really want to share too much out loud because I kind of want you guys to go and give credit to the people who made the recipes and all that. We're just going to fast forward in time and here, when the bread is done, the machine will stay on to keep the bread warm, but I find it makes the bread come out kind of soggy on the bottom if you let it sit like that for a while. So as soon as it's done, I take it out right away to cool, but this machine is hot when you take it out. So I have to use like a towel or an oven mitt or something to help me like flip it over to get it out. As you can see, the bread does come out kind of textured on the sides, and that's totally fine. It's just from the air bubbles that form while the bread is proofing. But I mean, for a loaf of bread that I didn't have to monitor the whole time, I will take a kind of like textured exterior over the effort any day. I'd say the only downside, if you can call it that with a machine like this, is you do end up with a hole at the bottom where the paddle was but it's really never been something that affects my ability to eat it. I've also noticed that the bread comes out denser at the bottom and slightly fluffier at the top, but again, it's just something minor that I don't really think about while I'm eating my sandwich. So I would definitely recommend picking up a bread machine if you can find one at your local thrift store, because if you buy one of these, like brand new from online or in store or whatever, they're going to shoot between $50 and $100 depending on how bougie of a machine you want to get. So for $5, I would say I'm getting my money's worth using all-purpose flour and like one packet of yeast makes like two loaves of bread. So I'm having a good time with this machine. While the bread machine was off doing its own thing, I started on a loaf of cinnamon raisin bread. Off camera, I've had these raisins soaking in hot water for about 15 minutes, and after draining, I'm measuring a teaspoon of vanilla with my heart. In an effort to do as few dishes as possible, we're going to reuse the bowl and mix a quarter cup of brown sugar and eyeball a tablespoon of cinnamon because we also measure cinnamon with our heart. Like I said in the beginning, for the rest of the measurements, I'm going to leave the recipe in the description to give credit to the creator. And here, while I was creaming the sugar and butter, I was again reminded that I do not have real butter in the house, and I just did my best. If you watched my most recent food pantry haul video, you will see that I did receive butter from my food pantry for the month of May, but this video was filmed before that, so 
I don't I don't know what was happening here like it was separated but combined it it wasn't really getting fluffy it was I, I don't know. that could have been why this batter came out super dense and I kept having to read the recipe multiple times to make sure that I'd put as much liquid as it called for and when it came to the faux cinnamon swirl I wasn't entirely convinced that this was going to come out well but I just trusted the process and I followed the directions and baked this bad boy for an hour and in my opinion I could have pulled it out maybe five to ten minutes earlier as the top was a little too toasty for my liking and maybe doubled the amount of raisins but a coworker who tried this said it came out perfectly so take my comments with a grain of salt it could just be more of a personal preference Again, trying to cut down on the amount of dishes, we're going to take the opportunity to mix up a batch of muffins. I have made so many different variations of blueberry muffins because I never remember to save the recipe that I was using. So in my ever expanding journey, we are using the recipe that is on the oatmeal container. <laughs> I was devastated to discover that I only had like a tablespoon of leftover oatmeal. And at first, I attempted to set it aside and just tell myself to do something with it later. But as fate would have it, I also had a few blueberries left over. And I did the adult thing and just threw the extra blueberries in and used the leftover oats to compensate for the additional moisture. Now, a problem that I immediately ran into was I maybe should have defrosted the blueberries a bit because they froze my dough and made it very difficult to mix and spoon into the muffin cups. Like I said in the beginning, I really do not like baking, and now that I was three projects into the hour, I was very irrationally irritated at the situation, and I didn't even care how these came out anymore. Everything that went inside it was completely edible, so as long as it cooked, we were gonna eat it. I didn't really know if it was gonna come out as like a muffin muffin, but... You know, we're just gonna trust the process again. The direction said to bake them at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, but my cinnamon raisin bread was still cooking at 350 and still had like 45 minutes left on the clock, and I didn't want to keep my kitchen hot for any longer than I needed to, so I just slid them in as is, and as a result, the muffins didn't rise as much as they certainly would have at a higher temperature, but overall, they were a solid muffin. They were certainly more on the healthier side than other recipes I've tried, and if I was going to do this one again, I think the only change I'd make is to use brown sugar instead of white to give it a little more, like, muffiny, less healthy vibe and kind of trick myself, you know. And for my final trick, I've saved the most time-consuming recipe for last. On the bright side, no-knead bread is mostly hands-off for most of that time. I'm starting with three cups of flour, a teaspoon of yeast, half a tablespoon of salt, and as much water as it takes to make a shaggy dough. And I'm pretty sure I added a bit too much water, but it's fine. Your bread does come out with a little more like see-through texture or like translucent texture if you add too much water. It looks a little weird, I'm not gonna lie, but it's still edible. Once your dough is all nice and mixed together, you can stick a plate on top or a towel and just push it off to the side. Come back to it between 8 and 24 hours later. And here is what mine looked like after about 20 hours. And I'm just gonna sprinkle enough flour onto my table to keep the dough from sticking while I make it into a loaf-ish shape. This dough is very sticky and it mine is a little bit stickier because I added too much water, but you know, it's, it's fine. And to bake it, I'm going to use my Dutch oven, but for no-knead bread, you really just need anything that you can put a lid on. 
even if it's just two bread pans that you can stack on top of each other, which I could have done, but my raisin bread was currently occupying one of them, so the pot it is. You're going to want to preheat your oven to 450 degrees while whatever you're baking it in is in the oven. So you want to preheat whatever vessel you're using to make your no-knead bread. Once your vessel is nice and ripping hot, I sprinkle a little bit of cornmeal at the bottom, but you can use flour just to keep it from sticking. And then you're just going to plop the bread in, and I'm cutting slits on the top, but that is totally optional. Your bread is going to split while it's baking, and cutting slits into it kind of just guides where you want it to split. If you don't really care because you're just using this for like crusty bread to have on the side of like soup or something, you don't have to be that fancy with it. After that, you're going to put the lid on of your bread and cook it in the oven at 450 for 30 minutes. And after that, it's time to take the lid off and put it back in for another 15 to 20. This second round of baking is going to complete the cooking, but also give you a nice color on the outside. And it's up to you how dark you want it, so you could really leave this in for as long as you feel, but just know that the bread does come out very crusty, very crunchy. It is not something that's too great for sandwiches. It's very rustic, very crusty, and we generally use it as a toast with some kind of spread. Um, not many people may know about this product, and even more may scoff when introduced to it, but one of our favorite ways to use this bread is with a thin layer of mayo and then a thin layer of potted meat. I've never met someone who thinks brand name is important when it comes to food, but my grandpa only ever buys this Armour brand, so I keep up the tradition, so I couldn't tell you if any other brands exist or if they're very good. Well, that's everything I have to share with you today. I hope you found some inspiration in these breads today, and I hope you have a great day or night ahead of you. If you have any of your own favorite bread products, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And as always, if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. And if you liked what you saw, please leave a like and subscribe to see more in the future. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye!